name is Jonas, and I'm uh, going to talk to you a little bit about how you can do microservices with, uh, with Vapor, especially Vapor 3. Um, but before I begin, uh, just quickly, who am I? Uh, I'm a partner and core developer at Vapor together with uh, Tanner and Logan. Uh, I'm also an author at rayvenderlich.com, again, again, together with Tanner and Logan. Uh, I have a diverse background, mostly in, uh, in backend development and system administration, so uh, I know how to really proper format your, your backend, uh, but I can't develop your iOS application. Um, I didn't start with Swift before I got involved with Vapor. Uh, and you can, of course, find me on, uh, on GitHub Twitter uh, and on our Vapor Discord. <clears throat> so I want to just quickly talk about what this talk isn't about. Uh, so this isn't a one solution fit all. Uh, this is uh, the work of me and Tanner sitting together here in Berlin for three weeks trying to figure out what we think is the best way to do microservices. Um, it's our, uh, our recommendation, but it's not the only solution and there is many solutions and if you try to uh, Google uh, how to, to build microservices, you get tens of thousands of different approaches, most of them using Node.js, uh, on how you should do it. Uh, but this is what we feel like uh, is best suited for, for building it with Vapor uh, because of the internal architecture of Vapor. Uh, and this solution is easily scalable. I'll talk about this later because we actually use this uh, approach in production, uh, as I'll talk about. So, why should you use microservices? Um, if you have a large project, um, you end up in a situation where you have a massive code base. Uh, splitting your application up into microservices uh, gives you easier and smaller maintainable small projects. So you have uh, either one or more features into a, into a project and these projects will communicate uh, between each other. Uh, this makes it easier to, to uh, to update and maintain them. So for example, when Swift 4 comes out uh, during this year, uh, you can start with one microservice update that uh, without you have to update your entire code base at once, which makes it easier if you have a large project. Uh, we have our Vapor Cloud project right now, which is uh, a project the size of Vapor itself, uh, which would take us an insane amount of time to update. Uh, it's still running Vapor 2. Uh, we haven't really gotten around to uh, to look into that. So it, it makes your project, uh, you can split your project up into multiple smaller pieces, which makes it easier to, to update and maintain uh, with each feature. <clears throat> yeah, you can update your features in, independently and you can even use different technologies. So Vapor is a really great framework, but it might not be the best solution for all of your features. Um, so if you, for example, have a feature where you need to build into uh, Kubernetes, for example, uh, that's the world I'm in, you might use Go for that particular microservice. Or if you have something where it makes sense to use Node.js or PHP because there is the exact integration you need and you don't have time to build it, you can build a small microservice uh, using a different language and they'll easily be able to, uh, to work together uh, or use uh, different versions of Vapor if, if you want to do that, depending on what your needs are. And how did we, which structure did we choose and why did we do it? So basically we have an auth microservice that handles all authentication. This stores uh, user information, organization details, and all of these things uh, for our Weber Cloud 2 project. Uh, I'll go into a bit of details what it does. Uh, we have an API connector in every uh, microservice. This means that we have a Swift file for each connection that needs to go out of the specific microservice. Uh, I'll show you the code for this later. So basically you have a, um, you, you have a Swift file uh, with the endpoints that this microservice needs to contact other microservices. Um, and then you basically have the request token that is used to, to validate the endpoints. Um, of course, you need to have multiple of the same files with this way, but it's also, it also makes it easy to update. Um, and this way, each microservice can be updated individually. If I had a single package with all my connections, I needed to update them all together. Um, and it's easy to handle uh, breaking API changes. So if you have microservice A, microservice B, microservice A connects to microservice B, you only need to update that connection if you break the, the endpoints. 
uh, and each microservice have their own database. It's quite important when starting to work with microservices that they have their own database so they're only responsible for their own data. Because if you start sharing databases between microservices, you risk that you start breaking things with uh, especially migrations. Uh, so make sure that they have their own database, uh, not necessarily their own database server, but their own database on that server. Uh, and just to show you how, how we have structured things, uh, I have three microservices here. I have auth, uh, as I talked about before, apps and billing. Uh, and we have Bob. Bob starts to con contact auth. He gets a token back from auth. Now he has a token he can use uh, that is uh, identifiable from him. He contacts apps. Apps will contact auth, make sure that the token is valid get a, a request back that he have access to what he needs to, uh, to talk with. And if he tries to contact billing, he'll, it will again contact auth, make sure he has the permissions he needs, get it back, and we can show the data to, um, to Bob. <clears throat> this solution is running in Weber Cloud 2. Weber Cloud 2 is this huge uh, new version of our cloud service we are going to uh, to uh, publish soon. Uh, it's currently in alpha and we have, uh, uh, we have around mi eight microservices running right now during our alpha. Uh, when we are finished, we're gonna have over 15 microservices, uh, which means that this is really easy for us to scale with because the microservices are not dependent directly on each other. They're only dependent on each other's endpoints. This makes it e really easy for us to, to make uh, huge breaking changes without breaking anything in our existing code base. Um, and this, this have really made it easy for us. It's not without its drawbacks. There is drawbacks with every solution you would pick, uh, but we have really f uh, seen that we are so much faster at building this this way because we don't need to worry about that much about breaking our own systems when pushing out uh, major changes. Uh, and again, it's really easy maintainable uh, because I can sit and work in a microservice, Tana can sit and work in a microservice. Once we're done, we can, we can run the tests and make sure that everything works across it. Uh, we don't need to worry about uh, overriding each other's things. That's of course good things to, to help with this, but, but this makes it really easy for us to, to, uh, to work together uh, and having some good integration tests uh, really makes it easy to make sure that everything just works uh, with your services. Um, so for those of you who know what a JWT token is, uh, it's very big in the Vapor community and I want to talk to you about why we didn't choose this. Um, we basically just store a token in, in our database uh, and use that for authentication. Uh, we tried JWT with Cloud1 the problem with JWC is that in Weber Cloud you can have uh, you can be a part of uh, several organizations. We have users that have, are part of hundreds of different organizations. The problem is we need to store each UUID for each organization you have access to in the JWT uh, header. What happens with that is that you get a motherfucker big header that the web server just breaks. Either it takes an insane amount of time loading or it just breaks because the header is too big. Uh, so it isn't really a scalable solution. If you have that a, a user can be part of many teams, then JWT just doesn't give you anything. You also have the problem with JWT, you can't remove the token. So you need to make your tokens live for an extremely short period of time, usually if, uh, 10, 15 minutes, which means when you're sitting and testing against your API, you need to renew your token every uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, it's really annoying when developing. Uh, otherwise, if you, for example, said you, your, to your token lives for 24 hours, it lives for 24 hours, which means if, if that account gets compromised, you can't revoke these tokens. They are still active and alive until they uh, expire. That means that if a token gets compromised, uh, the user that compromised the, the account will still have access to update the password and everything else until the token uh, expires, <clears throat> which is a huge problem with, in my opinion, with JWT. Uh, 
And again, we can easily do that if you change your password or log out, we can log you out for, from every single account you're logged in with because each sign-in you do have its own token. So if you're logged in through an iOS app, uh, the raw API and from the dashboard, when you log out one place, we can uh, allow you to log out everywhere. If you change your password, log me out everywhere. Uh, this is really easy to do with this uh, token uh, solution. Okay. <coughs> I am going to show you a bit of what we have done with uh, this. So I have uh, cheated a bit because I really didn't have the time to prepare a live demo of this uh, and we didn't have time to do a live demo because even though it's simple, there is still a ton of things to do. So I have cheated with creating two small uh, <coughs> web applications, that's easy enough. It's easy enough in itself and I'm gonna open these up. Okay, it's just a simple endpoint that will show you how this code can work. <clears throat> and I am going to just, do, yeah. Okay, so I have a user, API user and an API post that is basically my two applications in this setup. Um, the users can connect to the post to get posts related to this specific user. So uh, the third thing I have is I uh, register a, a service with my post API um, uh, file to connect to the post API. Uh, and this makes it easy for me just to show an example of how you can, if you are in production, you can uh, use a live URL. If you're on local, you can use uh, a local URL, uh, and then up here I register my new, new server, so I'm sure that it always runs on the same port. So that means if Tanner pulls down these uh, two microservices now, they'll work the exact same way without him having to go in and change the, the code for the dev uh, system. Um, so basically I'll connect to, to uh, my base URL will be the, the API of, of my post. In my post API, uh, I have this simple struct that is basically, that will have uh, a function for each endpoint I'm calling. Uh, so for example, to get all posts, I'm returning a client get. It's simply the Vapor uh, client package, uh, HTTP package, that will return a future with an array of posts. I'm calling base URL uh, slash one because I want the user one. Uh, of course, there's no authentication, no nothing here, so don't use this in production. Uh, at all, uh, but it gives you the basic idea uh, and showing how to pass along a token if you want to do that. Um, <clears throat> I have this magic function that Tanner wrote for me that uh, tries to convert everything into nice. Uh, uh, so basically it takes the same uh, error code uh, you get. If, if I get an error code from my post API, I'll get the same in my user API. Uh, it was some magic Tanner wrote and I'm just copy pasting it works quite nice. It's also setting some identifiers so we know that the error come from the post API and not the user API. If we, for example, get a 404, we want to know where the error happens. Otherwise, if you have 15 microservices and you just get a 404 uh, not found, you can spend weeks on tracking down it, exactly what, what went wrong. So make sure to have a clear uh, monitoring of your, uh, of your microservice when going this direction. But basically this will just return it uh, and using it is easy. I'm passing in the container into my controller uh, with the post API. I'm calling that with posts. Um, and just to show you, this one is just an, a dummy, uh, f just returning a dummy future because I didn't really want to do that much about it. Um, and we can see in our routes, um, have this, I make a container make for my post API. That way I pass the container in, uh, so I can use that uh, to uh, work. And I have API user slash posts, and uh, let's try to call that. Um, I think I actually have it here. Paul. Um, Okay, I have it here, and see I'm calling uh, 80, 80, 81 uh, with API users posts, and oh, it's not booted up, of course. Yeah, 
I'm having eight different vapor projects open up. If I don't have a workspace for each, it's just impossible to figure out, uh, especially with the uh, with how slow uh, Xcode actually is when you have eight uh, different uh, services open, then it's just completely fucked up. Um, and as you can see, I get the data from the post API uh, through my user API. Uh, of course, this is an extremely simple example, uh, but this shows how you easily are able to do it. Basically, uh, what, what is required for this is just one file uh, to connect to it, and I can, of course, uh, copy this multiple times with multiple endpoints to call. Uh, this makes it really easy and really portable. Uh, if, if this endpoint at some point changes, I only need to go into this file, change the endpoint to what it needs to be, deploy this microservice so I don't need to deploy every single microservice every single time I make a change. We have had users uh, ending up in a situation where they actually have these huge uh, constraints between their microservices. Every time they make a change, they need to be deploy every single microservice. Uh, this gets rid of that, so all of the microservices work completely independent of each other, which is one of the beautiful things about microservices, that they can actually interact completely on their own. They don't need uh, to, uh, to think about each other. And one final thing I want to, if you are building this huge next application, uh, we have started to, to spend a lot of time instead of using Leaf. Leaf is a great tool for sending emails and doing simple web things. Uh, but we have started using a, a JS frontend. I know none of us likes JavaScript, uh, but it is actually quite good for, for client uh, facing websites. Uh, so I just wanted to, to involve you a, bit, a little bit in our, about how we do it. Uh, we use Vue.js. It give, gives a, quite a nice uh, framework for building your web frontend for your next big thing. Uh, it's, for example, what powers the, the Weber Cloud 2 dashboard. Uh, it, it, they have these um, components you can just use around. Uh, you can change the content of them. It makes it really easy. Uh, the Vapor website is also powered by Vue.js. Uh, we have basically started using it everywhere we can. Uh, Tanner loves it. Uh, and you can use the same API for web and mobile, so you don't need to build uh, your leaf templates and your API endpoints for your mobile app. So if you need the same data to be available both in your website and in your app, this makes it a hell of a lot easier because you just have your API endpoints uh, that everything connects to with the same data. That was it. Thank you very much.